So uh, I guess we can start. And uh, so what we're going to have a look at today and also over the next few days are a few suttas that are uh, closely related to meditation practice but also to the general development of the mind because in the Pali we often talk about citta bhavana and citta bhavana means uh, development of the mind and this is what the Buddhist path really is about and meditation is like one of the tools of that development of the mind uh, and it, obviously one of the core tools uh, that we use uh, so this is uh, going to have a look at some of these suttas and it's going to be many of the suttas that I usually do when I teach these retreats because there are some suttas that are more obvious like for example the discourse on the mindfulness of breathing is a very obvious one uh, because it is directly related to meditation practice and there are a few suttas like that that I like to do every time and I I uh, hope you don't mind doing the same suttas uh, I because personally I quite like doing the same suttas again and again because uh, it kind of just reinforces a certain view, a certain way of thinking about things. Uh, so uh, I personally find it quite useful. Uh, and so how, do you, how does one choose these suttas? And uh, uh, the suttas, the way I choose suttas is firstly I choose what I would consider core suttas in the Pali Canon. Uh, what is a core sutta? How do you know that something is core? Uh, because all the suttas are just suttas, uh, so what are the most important ones? And uh, the way to decide what is an important sutta is, uh, first of all, it has to uh, be some, a sutta that is an uh, early sutta, comes from the uh, time of the Buddha most likely. This is an important criterion. Uh, and of course, uh, the way to find that out is it has, should really exist in Chinese translation, it should exist in Pali, perhaps there is a Sanskrit version. So it should exist in the different schools of Buddhism. And if all the different schools of Buddhism has a sutta in common, then you can be uh, fairly sure it is an early one, quite likely stemming from the Buddha himself. Uh, so this is one uh, criterion. Another criterion is to see how often a particular theme is found in the Pali Canon itself. Uh, yeah? Certain suttas are found again and again uh, and they're given in different contexts with slight variations on a theme to different people, different circumstances. Uh, and those suttas that are found in many different situations like that, uh, they are the ones that obviously are the most important because the Buddha is teaching it to everyone. Uh, so for example, uh, and this suit I'm going to have a look at now is called volition, this kind of structure that you find here, uh, uh, whereby this is really the, what you might call the psychology of meditation, how you experience meditation uh, per, uh, subjectively. Uh, yeah? This is found across the various schools, it is found in many places in the Pali Canon, so that's why I take it to be a core teaching of the Buddha, an important aspect of his path. Uh, so this is important to know because uh, otherwise, you know, it, it has to be some system in how you uh, choose the suttas. They have to be important, significant, core parts of the Buddhist teaching. And uh, sometimes people say this, and this is quite interesting as well, sometimes people say that the Satipatthana Sutta is like, this is it, this is the meditation sutta, more important than any other sutta in Buddhism. And sometimes you travel around the Buddhist world and they have the Satipatthana Sutta on display and they bow down to the Satipatthana Sutta in the morning. Yeah. Actually, that's wrong already, you shouldn't you're supposed to bow down, you're supposed to practice according to it. Uh, but this is what happens in many places. Uh, so you bow down and you maybe you chant the Sutta. Uh, but the, last, the, what the one thing you don't do is practice according to it. Uh, you do everything else, uh, but you don't practice according to it. Uh, but, um, and this is kind of, and this is how, you know, these cultures often evolve. It's kind of natural, especially when it becomes something that is common to everyone in the culture. There's always only going to be a small minority that practices this path seriously. So when it becomes a cultural phenomenon, then it's going to be reduced down to a common denominator where you do something simple like just chanting it or whatever. But what is interesting about the Satipatthana Sutta uh, is of course that it is just one sutta among many. Yeah, the Satipatthana, Satipatthana Sutta, there's really only one Satipatthana Sutta. Some people say there's two because it exists in the Diganika and the Majjhima, but that is just a, really a duplication of the same sutta. Um, so it only exists once, and there's nothing in the suttas themselves to make the Satipatthana Sutta any more important than any other sutta. 
So the Anapanasati Sutta, for example, exists in many more versions than the Satipatthana Sutta. So if anything, I would say that is probably more important in some ways. Uh, but uh, there are other things about the Satipatthana Sutta. For example, you have the Satipatthana Sangyutta, which gives very short discourses on Satipatthana, and that sort of uh, increases its importance in some ways. But the Sutta itself uh, is just one Sutta among many, and uh, for that reason it is uh, no more important than any other sutta, really. So this is how you uh, consider the suttas, whether they matter or not. Uh, um, but um, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I have chosen this sutta. Another reason is because when I first read it, it really struck me as very interesting uh, and as very different to how I, I and many other people are sometimes taught about meditation practice. Uh, and this also was why I find it quite fascinating and interesting here. Uh, and this sutta is called Volition. So this is the first sutta of the meditation part of this uh, uh, retreat. And the Volition in Pali is Chaitana. So this is the Chaitana Sutta. From the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the chapter of 11s, uh, which means there is 11 factors uh, in the suttas, in this collection. Uh, and this is how it goes. And for those of you who have been here on these retreats before, you will know that this is, uh, you will know this sutta already. Uh. So this is how it goes. Bhikkhus. Uh, bhikkhunis, yeah. Bhikkhus are, bhikkhunis are included, lay, and lay men and lay women are also included. Uh. Everyone. Uh, <laughs> for a virtuous person, uh, one whose behavior is virtuous, uh, no volition need be exerted. Uh. Let none regret arise in me. Uh. It is natural that non-regret arises uh, in one who is virtuous, uh, one whose behavior is virtuous. Uh. For one without regret, no volition need be exerted. Uh. Let joy arise in me. Uh. It is natural that joy arises in one without regret. For one who is joyful, no volition need be exerted. Uh. Let rapture arise in me. Uh. It is natural that rapture arises in one who is joyful. Uh. For one who is rapt with a rapturous mind, uh, no volition need be exerted. Uh, let my body become tranquil. It is natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. For one tranquil in body, no will need be exerted. Uh, let me feel pleasure. It is natural that one tranquil in body feels pleasure. Uh, for one feeling pleasure, no will need be exerted. Uh, let my mind be stilled. It is natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure is stilled. For one who is stilled, no will need be exerted. Let me know and see things according to reality. It is natural that one who is stilled knows and sees things according to reality. So there you are. There is no real reference there to meditation as such. Uh, this is kind of the interesting thing about uh, uh, the way these things are often explained. You have to really know what is going on to see that, but of course stillness is mentioned there. Samadhi is mentioned there in the seventh factor, and of course to get to Samadhi usually you need some to do some medit little bit of meditation to get there. Uh, so, and the reason why meditation isn't mentioned as such uh, is because what we are seeing here is uh, we are seeing the subjective experience, the experience one of us, I each one of us ideally has uh, as we do the meditation, what it feels like internally as this process happens. Uh, so here there's no mention of any object, uh, there's no mention of what you do, anything like that. Uh, it is just the inner qualities uh, and how they are supposed to arise uh, when this process works as it's supposed to work. Yeah. So this is what this is. Uh, and this is very useful. One of the nice things about the way the Buddha teaches the Dhamma is that he teaches the same thing from many different angles. Uh, and here the angle is, how, what does it feel like to meditate when meditation works? Uh, and with that, uh, the idea, the point of this is that, of course, to have some kind of milestone in your meditation. Uh, you have to have a little kind of post, a little kind of signpost that says, now you're heading in the right direction. You know you are doing what actually uh, works. You know that you are heading towards all of these good things. Uh, so we need to have like a map, and this is really the map. This is the terrain that is supposed to happen. Uh. 
So this is what this is about. Yeah, this is about uh, how ideally meditation uh, occurs. Uh, and uh, what this means is that uh, it doesn't mean that while you are meditating you think about the sutta to compare the sutta to your experience. Uh, but you know the sutta so well, you have internalized it so much, uh, you don't really need to think about it, uh, but you know that those experiences you have, that they accord with wha uh, what the Buddha is saying in places like this. Uh. So very, very useful. Uh. Gradually you can see the happiness becoming deeper and deeper, uh, and eventually uh, stillness, and eventually seeing things in accordance with reality. Uh. So this is the first important things of this. You can call this, if you like, as I said a second ago, the psychology of meditation, how it feels, how it is experienced, uh, and so it is a psychological uh, um, development, if you like, a mental development. So this is the first thing about this. And the second thing about this sutta, which uh, w was the thing, I think, that really caught my eye when I first saw it many, many years ago, when I read this the first time, or second time, or third time, or whatever it was, uh, is just the emphasis on happiness in that experience. If this is about meditation, then meditation is all about happiness all the way through. Yes, you have sila at the beginning, and from the sila comes the non-regret. Non-regret is already a state of happiness because regret is a suffering, non-regret is a kind of happiness. Then you have the joy, yeah, joy starts to arise, joy, uh, the gladness, this is the pamuja in Pali, from the pamuja you have the piti, uh, more happiness, uh, tranquility, uh, even more happiness because tranquility is such a beautiful state of mind, we become very peaceful. Uh, from the tranquility comes the sukha, uh, even more happiness. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, what is that book by Jan Brahm? Bliss upon bliss upon bliss. This is probably a quote from this sutta, that's what I reckon. Uh, one bliss after the other, uh, and then from that uh, happiness comes the Stillness of the mind, the samadhi, comes from that, uh, one thing after the other. Uh, and then ultimately seeing things in accordance to reality, that's even more happiness. Uh, it may not be obvious, uh, but when you see things according to reality, that true is an extraordinarily happy and powerful experience. Uh, so the whole thing is about happiness. Uh, yeah, it's all about happiness. Uh, and this is one of those things about the Buddhist path. Uh, when we uh, kind of sell, when we market the Buddhist path, and we have to market it in the right way, we have to market it in a way that is meaningful to people. And sometimes if you focus too much on the Four Noble Truths, uh, you think that Buddhism is all about misery, and it's all about dukkha and, <laughs> and all of that. That's kind of what happens sometimes. Uh, and people think that Buddhism is so pessimistic. Uh, but uh, the reality, of course, is that that is just one particular approach to looking at the Dhamma. This is another way, and this is, should be part of our marketing package. Uh, yeah, this sutta. This is one of the reasons why I like like to I like to read it out because I am a Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm supposed to be a salesman of Buddhism, uh, so I have to be good at marketing. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the job, isn't it, of a Buddhist monk? Yeah, is to kind of sell these teachings. Uh. So uh, and the, and the price you sell them, it, 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 they are priceless. There, so there's no price. Uh, and this is kind of the good thing about this thing. So. It's it's actually it's m it's marvelous when you see this. Yeah, everything about this path, everything about meditation is about happiness. Uh, and of course, one of the things that straight away becomes clear when you see that is that if you experience too much pain in your meditation, too much discomfort, too much stress, uh, too much um, tension, and all of these kind of things, uh, there is no way you're going to be able to experience this this joy. Uh, and this is why when you start off with your meditation practice, uh, we start off with the basic ease, relaxation, uh, because that is where there is most opportunity for the joy and all the other happinesses to arise. Uh. By causing too much pain, sometimes you are hindering the, the, the joy and all the enjoyment to come as a consequence. Not always. Some people can use the pain to kind of go through and go further, and, uh, and uh, sometimes that's okay. I personally wouldn't recommend it, but you know, if, if it works for you and that's what you want to do, okay, no problem. Sir. But this, I think, is the ideal way, uh, is the what you find here in this particular sutta. So all about happiness. Uh, and. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is, and what a rare thing it is in, in the world's religions, to have a religion that is all really about happiness at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, so that is another thing about this sutta which is so marvelous. But an, a, a third thing that always struck me about this sutta is this idea that no will need be exerted, it says here. Na chetanaya karaniya. 
Nachetana Karaneya really means not to be done by will power. That's really what it means. Karaneya means to be done. Na, not, not to be done by willpower. Yeah, Chaitana is willpower or intention. Yeah, in other words, exerting your mind is not to be done in that way. And uh, in fact, uh, not only is it not to be done in that way, but the, the sutta here says that it is in accordance with nature. It is dhammata, and dhammata means it is a natural process. So this is what you can expect. Yeah, when you sit down on your bottom uh, and you watch the breath, uh, you can expect these two things to happen. Uh. It's a good deal, isn't it? You all have to sit, sit back, relax. Wow, joy happens uh, uh, according to this. Uh. And of course, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so I'm going to come back to that in a second, why it doesn't, even though it is a natural process. Uh, why doesn't it li give rise to joy? And there's a good reason for that. Uh, but ideally, all you have to do, uh, sit back, uh, relax, lean back, uh, oh, and then the joy starts to happen as a consequence. Uh, and what a beautiful thing that is. No need to will anything, no need to do anything. Uh, and all the striving in the world, all of that, you just put it to one side uh, and the process happens by itself. Uh, so if it is a natural process, uh, what that means is that the willpower, the willing of these things, the tr intending it, uh, the trying to do the meditation, is going to be come in the way, get in the way, right? Uh, because if it is natural, then you st try to kind of, you know, uh, make it happen, uh, it's going to be problematic. Uh, and the simile, which uh, uh, also comes from Ajahn Brahm, so much what I say comes from Ajahn Brahm, it's scary. Uh, <laughs> I have no individuality, I'm just this robot sent out by Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> But that's what happens, yeah, you get kind of completely brainwashed and you, you can't, you, you lose your ability to think for yourself after a while. But no, I, I, I do try to think for myself a little bit, but it, this is such a nice simile because it explains why this doesn't work. Yeah. And this is the simile of if you have a plant, plant, I think it, it, uh, it's a story that comes from somewhere, I think, and if you have a little plant, yeah, and you want the plant to grow, uh, the plant symbolizes your mind, you want to develop your mind, you want to develop this plant, uh, what do you do to make the plant grow? Well, you look after it, uh, you water it, yeah, you observe it carefully, you make sure that it doesn't have any insects or whatever kind of destroying it. Uh, but if you use too much willpower, uh, if you go and grab the plant uh, and try to pull it to make it grow faster because it's growing too slowly, uh, then you have a problem. Uh, yeah? The plant comes out on the ground, uh, it breaks, the, the stem breaks or whatever happens, uh, but you cannot make a plant grow faster by pulling it. Uh, and this is really, it, it symbolizes the uh, kind of the willpower idea. We try to make this thing happen by willpower when it is a natural process. The plant is also a natural process. Uh, you can't increase that process by pulling it uh, without doing something. And if, even if you succeed a little bit, you pull a little bit, the plant gets deformed. Yeah? So you get deformed meditation as well. Uh, the meditation, <laughs> that's what happens, yeah? Willpower, that's where you start to go a bit funny sometimes. That's where people go, can go, you know, sometimes you hear about people who have psychological problems uh, in because of meditation, and that happens very often because of too much willpower. Uh, that's why these things occur. So if you don't use willpower, also, really, there is not much chance that you're going to go crazy as well. Uh, it's good news, isn't it? Uh, not less chance of going crazy. We don't really want that during the meditation retreat. Uh, so uh, this is so this is how it works then. So don't pull the meditation. Uh, allow it to happen naturally according to cause and effect, uh, and then you are likely to have the best kind of results. Uh. And it's actually an important point. I was kind of I shouldn't maybe joke too much about people going crazy because for some people it's a very serious thing. Uh, and uh, if you have any doubts about that in your own meditation, then uh, if you feel that kind of things are going slightly in the wrong way, you start to feel a bit deluded or things aren't going right, your anger is increasing or whatever, that is why you have to be careful. Uh, but as long as your mind is nice and balanced, uh, yeah, and you feel relatively good, uh, there's nothing really that can go wrong in meditation practice. Uh, you're just relaxing. Uh. But some people do have a hard time with meditation, so be a little bit careful. Uh, uh, especially if you are new to this practice uh, and you don't really know exactly how it works, be gentle uh, and be careful, and then you'll be you'll be fine as a consequence. So, uh, uh, and uh, what 
also is so striking about this idea of not doing anything here. This is exactly what Ajahn Brahm had been teaching me all these years and teaching everyone all these years. Yeah, sit back, relax, allow everything to just work out. And I used to think, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, you, that may, may work for you, but not everyone can do that. And then one day you read it in the suttas, uh, and it actually fits in very beautifully with the way that uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm was teaching. And this is one of the things that always was very important to me, was the idea that uh, uh, what is in the suttas uh, should fit with how your teacher teaches things. Uh, if there is a discrepancy between the suttas and a teacher, then there is a problem. Uh, if the things fit together nicely, uh, then, of course, uh, you know it is very likely to be a proper and a good teaching. Uh. So uh, that is um, another part of this uh, sutta, which makes it so interesting and so unusual in many ways. Uh. Now, the, the, the next thing I uh, want to talk about is, uh, well, what if you sit down and you relax and you do all the things that seem to be right for meditation practice, uh, but you don't feel that happiness? Yeah, This is a very common experience. You sit there, but there isn't any joy in the meditation. There are a number of people who do feel joy, uh, but there's also a lot of people who don't g give rise to the joy. It's very also very common. Uh, so why isn't that happening here? Yeah. And uh, in a sequence like this where everything is happening naturally, one thing going to the next one, uh, and everything is, is a kind of a causal sequence. Uh, the most interesting points in a causal sequence is the first point and the last point. Uh, because the first point is the one that shows you why the whole sequence takes off. Uh, once the first point is in place, uh, everything else will happen as a natural consequence. Uh, so the first point here is very, very important for understanding why it doesn't work. Uh. And the first point in the sequence is sila, yeah, this uh, Pali word. Uh, and uh, so what this means is that if the sequence doesn't work, uh, you need to go back to the very beginning and you need to ask yourself, is there perhaps some kind of deficiency in my sila? Have I not purified it enough? Uh, and what you will find is that it is actually very hard to have perfectly pure sila. Yeah, it is really difficult. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the reason it is difficult is because uh, it is very difficult to be consistently kind all the time. It is difficult because the Buddhist idea of sila is so profound. It includes so many aspects of our you know, personality, of our habits, of our character and all of these things. And all for to get all of these things into play is actually is very hard. So because of that, there's almost always something more you can do about sila. So what to remember about um, Sila in Buddhism is that we often translate it with morality or virtue as here, but actually sila, it means almost like your entire development of your character. Huh? It means your habits, it means almost like who you are as a person. Huh? Yeah? And uh, once you get that, then you start to kind of uh, understand the scope of this. So it is not just about avoiding the bad things, uh, sila is also about doing the good things. Uh. Yeah, so it is about actually living, uh, uh, not avoiding the bad, but actually deliberately being kind, uh, deliberately being generous, uh, deliberately saying the right things and all of this. Uh. Yeah, so this is so, and usually when we talk about morality in the English language, it is limited to not doing bad things, uh, but here it also includes doing the good things. Uh. But what is even more interesting about sila is that uh, it is not just uh, in most, usually when we talk about morality in English, morality is about how we act towards other people. Uh, but here it is also your own mental state uh, that is part of sila. So how do you think about others? Uh, do you have general thoughts of loving kindness and compassion and, and all of this? Uh, do you have thoughts of generosity? Uh, do you have? Uh, uh, do you tend to be wise, uh, or are you uh, are you more deluded kind of character? Yeah, all of these things are also part of sila, and that is when you start to see how profound it is. Uh. And for most people, they can do a little bit more on the side of uh, uh, metta, the side of compassion, and all of these things. Very few people who have metta all the time. Uh, yeah, always kind to others. Uh. Even noble ones, even if you're a stream enter, then still sometimes you know you may not have meta towards other people. So uh, this is where you have to look, yeah. And this is what uh, just yesterday we we're talking about the simile of the saw in the talk uh, yesterday morning, uh, and that is really how far meta goes. Yeah, the simile of the saw. You know the simile of the saw. Simile of the saw is, is the simile of. Uh, there's one person who doesn't know, so I'll just very briefly the simile of saw is the simile where. Uh, 
the Buddha says uh, that uh, even if bandits take you, pin you down, hold you down, take out a saw, two-handled saw, you have a big, sharp saw like you had in ancient India two and a half thousand years ago, hold you down and they saw you apart, limb by limb, saw off your arms, saw off your legs, maybe eventually saw off your head. Still, even, th even though they do that, uh, you don't have any anger towards them. Uh, all you have is metta and compassion for them. Uh. That is the simile of the saw. Yeah? So this tells you about the kind of extent of Buddhist morality and how far, ideally, it should be taken. So it is very, for this reason, it is very profound. Uh. So, um, so, so there's always something more we can do in these areas. And remember, this is in large part what the practice is about, especially outside of a meditation retreat like this, uh, uh, in our daily life, it is to ena enable us to, uh, or actually to put that into practice. Uh, hopefully you don't have to deal with the simile of the soul, because that would be pretty, pretty terrible if you actually got into that situation, but there are similar situations, yeah, maybe not quite as bad as that, but where our patience is really tested, uh, and we have to uh, endure something, uh, some, you know, not quite that far, but uh, something similar. Uh, and uh, uh, this is where the test gr testing ground is, uh, and this is where we prepare ourselves uh, for the meditation retreats. Uh, and uh, this is one of the things that is very useful to remember about uh, meditation or the spiritual practice in general, uh, is that every year when you go on a meditation retreat, uh, whatever it is, uh, you should hopefully see a little bit of progress, uh, yeah? a little bit of more clarity, uh, a little bit more gentleness inside of you, uh, mindfulness being a bit stronger, uh, being a bit more ability to focus on the breath, a bit more samadhi, a bit more joy arising perhaps in a meditation. And when you see that, it can be difficult to see these things in, a kind of in our daily life, but when you go on a retreat for a few days, uh, then you get some idea of whether you actually are heading in the right direction or not. That is ideally how you should, what should happen. If that is not happening, uh, you need to ask yourself why. What is the, what is the reason? Uh, what can I improve in my, uh, the rest of my life to make this happen when I go on meditation retreat? And then it feel, starts to feel very fulfilling. Uh, if you really start to feel that things are changing uh, from year to year or even you know, uh, after six months or whatever, uh, whatever it is, I don't know how often you go on a retreat, uh, uh, it becomes incredibly fulfilling because you, fe you have this feeling that you're on the path. You have a feeling that it's heading somewhere. You're actually going somewhere. Yeah, if nothing changes, if every year the mindfulness is the same, then you wonder whether you're actually going anywhere. Is this working or is it not working? Yeah. But if you do see changes happening inside of you, it gets very encouraging. Yeah. You feel really encouraged to continue with the practice. Yeah. So it actually is important that you check, yeah, am I making progress or not? Yeah. Uh, and because the Buddha promises that if we do practice in the right way, it will actually give results. Yeah. So there should be some results there. Yeah. There should be something happening. There should be change happening here. Uh, if I look at my own life over 23 years, uh, I have seen a lot of change over 23 years. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of slowly, 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 and it builds up over time. Uh, and that is extraordinarily encouraging when you see that. Uh. So go back to Sila. That is where the problem uh, uh, is. Uh, and if the Sila isn't perfected yet, uh, that is the reason why this process doesn't happen naturally. Uh. There's one other aspect to sila, which is also very kind of unusual. You don't normally uh, imagine this being included in sila, but that is having right view. Straight view is actually part of sila. And this is uh, something you find in a teaching of the Buddha called the Dasa Kusala Kamma Pata, which you may have heard of, the uh, ten, uh, 10 courses of wholesome action. Kusala Kamma is wholesome action, wholesome kamma. Pata is like a uh, uh, path, yeah? So the ten courses of, uh, <laughs> the ten pathways of wholesome action, yeah? Dasa kusla kamma pata. And this is like the Buddha's most uh, kind of detailed expression of what is sila in Buddhism. Yeah, and in there you have the th uh, three kinds of uh, verbal, of three kinds of bodily conduct, the three kinds of verbal conduct, and the three kinds of mental conduct. Uh, so mental conduct is included, and one of those mental conducts uh, is the uh, right view. Uh, yeah, it's called the, uh, what is it called there? Aviparita uh, ditti or something like that, aviparita sanya, a non-distorted view, a non-distorted outlook, uh, something like that. Uh. And um, uh, that is part of it as well. Uh. 
And so even just learning to have a right view about things, thinking about the world in the right way, uh, all the things that I was talking about uh, earlier on today during uh, the initial talk about meditation, about thinking about the world in such a way that it brings you back to the meditation, brings you inside of yourself, finding the refuge within rather than finding the refuge in the world. All of that matters enormously here, yeah, because you know your priorities change, your values change, you know what is really valuable in life, uh, and then uh, that, of course, is going to be a very powerful support for your meditation practice uh, and for your spiritual life overall. Uh. So, and uh, how do we get that right view? Well, the main way to get th that right view is just to reflect on some of these things. What is impermanence? Yeah, the way I w uh, in, in the way I have been teaching is perfectly okay, but also do it in your own way, yeah? something that works for you. Huh? Uh, be creative about this uh, if you can. Huh? Um, read the suttas. The suttas is, are just right view. Yeah, it's just 5,000 pages of right view. That's what the suttas are. Huh? It could be just be called right view, the entire collection. Huh? And uh, instead of calling it sutta pitika, the right view pitika, something like that. Yeah, so it's all right view. Huh? So every time you open that sutta pitika up and you read it, huh, you get a little bit of brainwashing. Your views get straightened out, uh, yeah, and you have more clarity about the nature of reality. So just reading suttas is a way of getting right view. Uh, listening to occasional Dhamma talks, yeah, if you don't, if you get, if you find it hard to read the suttas, you can also listen to good Dhamma talks that are in line with right view. Uh, you have to have a kind of feeling that they are just about right. Uh, you can listen to that as well, and then also that too uh, is going to support you in your right view. Uh. So, like I said yesterday, hanging out with the Buddha, yeah, that is really the ideal way of doing this. Uh. So, and that makes it very interesting. Now you have some idea that sila is very, very broad on the Buddhist path. Uh, even right view uh, is included in sila. And this is why I say to call sila morality uh, is really a very deficient translation in many ways, because it's so much broader than that. Uh, it includes your entire mental habit, yeah, your ent entire mental character is really part of this. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, the way to think about it. Uh. So if you, you know, and uh, as you purify the sila more and more, every time you will, that will enable you to go a little bit deeper in your meditation. Uh, and uh, this is the beauty of this. Uh, so more sila, better meditation. Even more sila, even better meditation. And gradually, the two actually often tend to help each other. Because when you have better meditation, that also leads your ability to investigate your mind and understand what you need to do to then deepen the meditation, uh, deepen the sila even more. Uh. So they have they are two sides of the same coin in many ways. Uh. And you know, of course, the Satipatthana Sutta is all about, towards the end, it's all about understanding the five hindrances. Uh, yeah? And that, of course, shows you how the connection between meditation and sila works. Uh. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, how familiar you are with the Satipatthana Sutta. I know some of you are, uh, because I, I know some of you are know the sutta really, really well, but uh, probably many, many of you are not. But the very last part of the Satipatthana Sutta is called the Dhamma Nupassana part, uh, the contemplation of Dhammas, contemplation of causality or principles or mental states. Uh, and, and an important part of that is the contemplation of the five hindrances, uh, understanding what they are, how they arise, how they are abandoned, all of these things. Uh, yeah, so in there, uh, meditation is directly related to sila, to mental sila uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta. So, so meditation and uh, sila are very closely related to each other here. So, so, so there you are. That shows you the importance of sila in Buddhism. And that is why it is such a shame when sometimes you hear about the, uh, you know, the Mindfulness movement around the world would have taken out mindfulness and all the teachers mindfulness and no sila, no morality. You, straight away you understand how shallow it is. Uh, it's not going to go very far. Yeah, you're going to have a, it's going to be a little bit helpful. So, I, you know, that's good, but it's not going to take you very far at all. And really, we should all teach mindfulness together with sila because uh, it, they, they go, it goes so beautifully together. And uh, this is what you are seeing here. Huh? There's a nice uh, sutta also, if you read the Maha Parinibbana Sutta, which I've been doing a lot recently, uh, there's a nice summary of the Dhamma in the Maha Parinibbana Sutta. And 
There the Buddha is moving around from one village to the next one, from one town to the next one. And as he does so, he gives teachings every place he goes. Everybody is really keen on listening to the Buddha. Maybe they understand it's the, you know, he's about to pass away or something. And the teaching that he gives, it's only summarized very briefly. Teaching is, this is sila, this is morality, this is wisdom. Yeah, this is just in brief, so obviously he explains these things a little bit more. Uh, and then he says, uh, Samadhi, when imbued with sila, is powerful and has much fruit and much benefit. Uh, yeah, Samadhi, when imbued with sila, has much fruit and much benefit. Uh, this is what we're seeing here. Uh, yeah, when the meditation sequence is imbued with sila, that is when it is beneficial, that is when it's useful. So even if you are lucky and you get one kind of nice meditation, uh, what happens? You spend the rest of your life craving for that meditation, you can't get it back because you were just lucky here, uh, yeah, and it doesn't come back again. Uh, but if you do purify the sila, then that is not no, no longer a matter of luck, then your meditation will regularly be happy, regularly have these kind of characteristics to it. Uh. And then the Buddha says, after saying that samadhi imbued with sila is of great benefit, of great fruit, uh, then he says that wisdom imbued with samadhi is of great benefit and great fruit. Uh. Yeah? So it is only when wisdom is imbued with samadhi that it is really beneficial and fruitful. Uh. Another one of those very important teachings. Uh, and it shows you uh, also the importance of Samadhi on the Buddhist path, it is fundamental, it's, uh, it's an eight, eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's also found here, right in this sutta. So now let's go to the other end of the sequence, uh, because as I said, the ends of the sequence are in many ways the most uh, important ones. Uh, and I have to warn you, I have actually left out the last three factors of the sequence, uh, so it's not really the end, but it's the end as far as we're concerned today. Uh. <laughs> So, uh, and, and here the end point again is the idea of the stilled mind. When you have a stilled mind, uh, you don't need any volition. Uh, you don't need any will. May I see things in accordance with reality? Uh. Isn't that kind of interesting? Uh? Yeah, when you come out of samadhi, you naturally see things in accordance with reality. Uh. You don't really have to do very much anymore. Uh. People say that there is the tendency for you to kind of get stuck in samadhi sometimes. Actually, there's nothing really about that in the suttas, but uh, sometimes this is what you, you some, sometimes you hear that. But uh, really, if you have, if you come to stillness, if you come to samadhi, and you started out the process with the right view, yeah, at the very beginning, which hopefully you did because you're part of a Buddhist group, uh, you're not, this is not a kind of Hindu group or anything like that. If you're a Hindu, then it might be different. But if you come to a Buddhist group, uh, start off with the right view, then you will naturally see things according to reality when you come to samadhi. Uh, it's kind of interesting, and that explains a lot about the path. One of the strange things about the Buddhist path is that uh, uh, the path only has eight factors, the Noble Eightfold Path, and the very last factor is uh, Sama Samadhi. So what about the wisdom people often ask, if this is the last factor? Uh, well, this is the point. I, is, is it, now you understand why the Noble Eightfold Path ends with uh, with the jhanas, with Sama Samadhi. And the reason is because once you get there, you have done the work. Now the rest is automatic. You see things according to reality when you have Samadhi. And that's why it stops there. So this is, uh, this is all we have to do. And when you get there, you just sit back, you wait. And then if you keep on practicing the Samadhi, one day, bang, the lights go on. And you see things fully according to reality. This is what happens. And then, uh, when you see things according to reality, what happens then? Uh, I, have, I, I should have put them in there. I don't know why I chopped the suit off, because the next part is also actually very nice. When, when you see things according to reality, it depends on the degree to which you see things in according to reality. But the next factor after this, this is yata bhuta jnana dasana, yeah, seeing things according to reality. Then after that comes nibida. Nibida is this feeling of turning away. You turn away from the world because you understand that all the things in the world are painful. Seeing things in accordance with re reality always means that you see the three characteristics. You see dukkha, you see an anicca, yeah, you see uh, things are unreliable and imp impermanent. You see that they are suffering and painful, and you see that they are non-self. So you see that they are suffering. Yeah, this is one of the things you see. Well, if you see that things are suffering, what happens? You turn away from those things. Uh, you don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. Uh, this is what nibita means. Uh, it's like an aversion almost. When I say aversion, I don't mean ill will or anger. I mean like 
oh, I can't take it anymore. You turn away, yeah, it's like uh, you are repelled by it, don't have anything to do with it, uh, as if you're seeing something disgusting, yeah, I don't want to see it. Uh. And this is what happens at this particular point. This is what seeing things according to reality means. Uh. And because of that, uh, you have viraga. Viraga means the fading away of craving. Uh. You cannot fa crave for suffering. Uh. Maybe you can, but it means you are you are dis you have a distorted perception somewhere, yeah? You can't really crave for suffering if you really believe it's suffering. If you crave for suffering, it means that somehow you think the suffering is happiness. Uh. So, so you have viraga, and because of the viraga, craving is fading away, then eventually you are liberated when the craving disappears completely. Yeah? This is the path, this is what happens after this. Uh. But I usually the reason why I leave it out is because it is very profound, yeah, and it comes way down the uh, sequence, uh, way down the process. Uh, but it's kind of nice to know what is there anyway, so you know what you're kind of where you're going here. Uh. So liberation is the end point. Vimuti is the end point of this sequence. Uh. So those are the two end points. Uh, what we are, uh, what this is about. Uh. So uh, let us look at this in a little bit more detail, the various factors here, just to be clear what these mean. Remember these are like signposts in your meditation. Uh, you don't need to remember these things because uh, it will kind of be there anyway. You have a rough idea what is going on, but it's good to, to uh, just have, a, have that background so you know what's going on here. So you start off by being virtuous, and when you are virtuous, as I described before, in all its details, uh, then you have non-regret. Uh, you are naturally have no regret. What does it mean not to have any regret? And uh, it's important to, I think, get understand this right, because uh, non-regret, very often you might think, you know, if you have regret, you think, oh no, I shouldn't have done that, that was a mistake. That's like a regret, yeah? You regret, you have remorse, what you did before. Uh, but uh, it is more subtle than that, because sometimes you may not do exactly the right thing, it may be a small thing, it may be something that doesn't actually affect you quite to that extent, uh, but what it may do, it may uh, kind of make the mind a bit more dull, yeah, a bit less happy, uh, a bit kind of more, uh, there's like you, uh, uh, the mind uh, loses some of its brightness, yeah. And this is kind of part of regret, if you like. Uh, you do something and you don't really, you know, it, it doesn't actually give rise to a positive state of mind. Instead, you lose a bit of your energy, you lose a bit of your mindfulness. Uh, and this is part of almost like non-regret. You can see how your actions affect your mind. Uh, and if you watch very carefully, uh, you should be able to see these things. The opposite of uh, non-regret here is feeling happy about how you live. Yeah, It's feeling joyful. Yay, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, and when you feel, yay, I'm doing the right thing, you, that is bright, it's a bright feeling. Yeah, you feel really good about that. You feel, you actually feel bright inside, you feel, this is what the, the kind of that, you know, you may not think the word yay, but you may think, you know, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and it lifts you up. Uh, mindfulness arises together with uh, that uh, non-regret comes the mindfulness, uh, comes often a pamudja, which is the next factor here, arises as well, and the energy. Uh, these are three factors that kind of exist around each other in the suttas. You see them together very often. Mindfulness, energy and joy. Uh, these are things that arise together uh, and they belong together uh, as part of a, you know, uh, um, a, uh, a nexus or a, or a set of ideas that are part of each other. Uh. So this is the idea of non-regret. You want to create the opposite of non-regret, which is like the light and bright mind, which is happy about how you live. Uh. And then because you're this, you are already happy and with how you live, uh, now mindfulness becomes strong. This is why mindfulness is always supported by morality. Uh. Mindfulness is sharp. When mindfulness is sharp, when you are in the present moment, you have no re regret, you often feel energetic. Uh. Yeah, when there's mindfulness, there are hardly any defilements there because the defilements are precisely the thing that take you out of the present moment. Uh, if you have desire, you're thinking about the future. If you have ill will about something, you're often thinking about the past. Uh, so when the de defilements go down, mindfulness goes up. When the defilements go down, energy comes into the mind because there is nothing there to block the natural energy of the mind. Uh, there's an important distinction here between energy and effort. Uh, uh, which I may talk about later on. Bec uh, and the difference is that effort means you apply yourself. Uh, 
You try, you are trying, that's what effort means, yeah? You put in the effort to think differently, you try to think in a different way or whatever it is. Uh, you put in the effort to do whatever. Uh. But energy is different, energy is a naturally occurring thing in the mind. So when you uh, feel mindful, you feel happy, you can feel you have a natural energy inside. You can be completely still, you may not be doing anything, you may not be making any effort whatsoever, still you have the energy inside. Uh. Yeah, it's like the mind is energetic, yeah, but without moving. Yeah. It's a peaceful, um, unagitated, non-restless energy. Yeah. And this is what you're seeing at this particular point. The energy in the mind is going up. Uh, and together with mindfulness, uh, together with the joy, together with the pamuja, these are states of mind that arise, tend to arise together. Yeah. All very wonderful and nice states of mind. So what is that pamuja? Pamuja is that Gladness, yeah? You feel glad. You know that you're living well. Uh, you know you're doing the right thing here. Uh, you feel good about yourself because you're living, living well here. Uh. This is what it is. Uh, as simple as that. You feel this kind of, you know, you, you are kind of skipping around a little bit. Yeah, you have a light step. You are, you know, you, you, you have all of these qualities being there here. Uh. And of course, I'm sure almost all of you have probably experienced these things sometimes uh, because these are natural human emotions. Everybody experiences this, but we want to experience more of that uh, and less of the dull and the dark states. Uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of the idea here. Uh. And then from that uh, pamudja, remember this is all about meditation practice. Uh, so what you are doing here, you are seeing these things while you are doing your meditation. So you may be watching your breath, and then these things arise as you are watching your breath. Uh, and we will see that when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta later today and tomorrow, we will see how uh, this particular sutta, it uh, matches almost perfectly with the Anapanasati Sutta, yeah, stage by stage. Uh, there's a very strong match, a strong correlation between the two. Huh? And I should have said there's also a very strong correlation between the Anapanasati Sutta and the seven factors of awakening as well. Huh? Yeah, uh, because when you have the seven factors of uh, awakening, they look also very similar to this particular sequence that you have here. Uh, the seven factors come roughly the same sequence and because of all of these things point towards the same thing, you know that you're dealing with a very important teaching uh, because all of these things are pointing in the same way. All of these are core aspects of the Dhamma. The seven factors of awakening are one of the sets that are part of the 37 aids to awakening, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, which the Buddha specifically said, this is my teaching, this is what you should carry on after I pass away. Uh, yeah? So these are all core aspects of uh, the Dhamma. So uh, uh, you have the Pamuja, and as you meditate, as you watch the breath, as you do your metta practice or whatever it is that you are doing, that Pamuja becomes more refined. You're becoming more peaceful because you are taking the meditation further. And then uh, when you do that, the joy becomes more powerful, uh, and it becomes the piti here. Uh, yeah, the PT is uh, one of these words you see throughout the suttas uh, and can often be found as very powerful joy in the body. Uh, yeah, when you can feel like fluctuations of joy going through the body, it uh, feels very, very, very rapturous and very, very pleasant at this stage. Uh, and uh, people can experience PT in many different ways, but very often it is like a physical feeling. Some people only feel it as a mental feeling, so we are all slightly different in this way, uh, but it becomes very, very happy at this particular point. Uh. And then, uh, as you keep on practicing, uh, yeah, you keep on going with the breath, uh, uh, the joy is there, but it is still a little bit coarse, the joy. Uh, yeah? It's a bit happy, the body is still, you can still feel the body. Uh, so as you keep on practicing, watching the breath, uh, doing the metta, or whatever it is, uh, you start to calm everything down. Uh, things become more peaceful. Uh, yeah? The joy becomes more refined, it doesn't have that kind of physical aspect to it, the body starts to disappear, the body goes into the background uh, and everything becomes very tranquil. Uh. The body becomes solid, it becomes like a rock, you're sitting there, yeah? you feel immobile, you don't want to go anywhere in the whole world, you feel, whoa, so solid. Uh. And like I was saying yesterday, you have this image in your mind of Ajahn Brahm sitting there on the stage and this woman thinks that he's dead. Yeah, I, I mentioned that yesterday, you think he's dead because uh, you can't see him moving. Yeah, he doesn't breathe, do no nothing. And even the mosquito gets confused because the mosquito goes round and round in circles, doesn't know where to land. Not sure if this is a, is this a rock, is it a tree, is it a human being, what is this? Uh, 
And this is kind of the stillness, yeah? You become not only inwardly so content, so satisfied, so you want to sit there forever, but also externally you look a bit like that, yeah? You become, you become what you, almost what you feel like. Yeah? And this is very pleasant. Usually we are driven by a little bit of restlessness in our life, by a little bit of agitation, always driven around. But now you don't have that driving force anymore. Huh? Now you're sitting there, so content, so pacified. So, and it is so wonderful to feel that, instead of having this slave driver inside you that always drives you around. Uh, this is how the Buddha compares restlessness to the, uh, you know, to you are a slave. Yeah, the restlessness is whipping you over the back. Okay, move, get going. Okay, yes, yes, and you run off to work, yeah, and then you run back home again, and you do all these things. Uh, and we are the slaves to restlessness, or slaves to craving. That's one of my other favorite expressions, and is that you are a slave to craving. Slaving is kind of whacking you over the back and saying, okay, run, work, do, act. And then one day, all of this drops away here. Uh, and you feel peaceful, you feel calm, and you understand how beautiful it is uh, to not to have that slave driver on your back all the time, making you run against your... Actually, you never wanted to do all this running in the first place. That's what you suddenly realize. Uh, this is so much better. Yeah. And this is what happens here. This is the Pasadi. Yeah? Um, from Pamudra comes the Piti. Yeah? Take the Piti further, comes the Pasadi. You start to become really, really peaceful. Yeah? It starts to become very, very nice. Uh, and because it is so peaceful, uh, because you are so tranquilized, uh, because you don't want to do anything in the world, uh, the happiness that starts to arise at this point is a very subtle uh, and beautiful and profound and immensely attractive kind of happiness. Uh, and it is so attractive, uh, you can't have your mind on anything else. Uh, your mind starts to become one-pointed. Uh, all you can see, all you can experience is this wonderful happiness uh, that is there for the taking right now. Uh, you yeah, have still powerful happiness, uh, and that is what takes you to samadhi, uh, because uh, it is so powerful. Uh, it draws you in, uh, and then that samadhi arises. And in the suttas, uh, when the Buddha talks about samadhi, the most important part of that samadhi is the four jhanas. Yeah? This is what the Buddha really means by samadhi in the suttas. Uh, can mean lesser forms of samadhi, but that is the main meaning of it. Uh, and then uh, you go into samadhi, the hindrances are blown away, uh, uh, and your mind becomes incredibly powerful and strong. Uh, and then when you come out afterwards, then uh, you see things in accordance with reality. Uh, yeah, and then you start to understand how the things, what things are like. Uh, you have the bird's eye view. Uh, you've given up all sensual desires. You've given up the five senses for a while. Uh, you've seen the world from a completely different angle, a completely different point of view. Uh, and then you start to understand uh, what the world really is like, where real happiness lies, uh, what really is the point of all of this, uh, and what is worthwhile doing and what is not worthwhile doing in this world. Uh. So, uh, there you are. That is this little sutta on uh, volition, uh, and uh, just in a sense, just backing up some of the points of my previous talk this morning, uh, when I talked about happiness and just waiting and being patient and all of that, uh, allowing it to happen naturally, uh, I, you know, so I make sure that I always try to keep the word of the Buddha not too far away, uh, and that is uh, what that is about. Uh. So, uh, let us have a break. Uh, uh, till about quarter to three, so about 20 minute break or so, uh, and then we'll come back and do some meditation together uh, afterwards. Uh.